Uh, welcome to Reason and Theology. Hosted by Michael Loft and the crew, he's a prodigy. Truth for no apology. No apostasy, love philosophy. Apostasy described because it's hassle free. Debate, rattle, confused. From the Council of Jerusalem, the Vatican II. You only got one rule. Don't sabbatical for true. Dialogue with individuals to interview a crew. Christ the King for the whole earth. Reigns to bring the sole purpose of my whole verse. Yo, check what I raised me on. Thankful for our viewers and our Patreons. Ain't no stopping me, I stay on philosophy. I gotta be a real life prodigy. Prophecy predicted the Messiah. We spit fire while y'all sitting then get higher. Like Mariah, but we keeping it clean now. See now, RT, stay on the scene now. We vow our whole life to Christ. We infuse with grace and insight on life, but uh. You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussion, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lawton. Welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> Second stream for the day, Tuesday evening. Doing a show here with River Run. I'm gonna bring him on in just a moment, but y'all, uh, y'all familiar with him? He is a reader from some of the audio books, and he's uh, been on previously. We're discussing modernism and what it is, and how to properly define it, and how to recognize it, things like that. Today we're going to be doing Skillebex and accusations of weaponized ambiguity at Vatican II because this is something that comes up all the time. And so I definitely look forward to this. We constantly hear that a lot of the Pariti were uh, deliberately inserting ambiguity into the text. Some tend to think that bishops were doing the same. So we are bringing River Run on, who has done some studying here, and will talk to us about it. Uh, so yeah, that's what's coming up next. River Run, hello, sir. How are you? Hey, Michael. How are you doing today? Good. Good to have you back on the show. Okay, so I want to start... I'm going to start with a. I'm going to start with a passage from Lefebvre, uh, an ominous, dark, uh, fully contextualized passage, so that we know what's going on. So I'll start. All right, let's do it. The consequences of modernity are visible in many places in the annals of the Council. Read again the beginning of the schema, the Church in the modern world, on the changes in the world today the accelerated movements of history, the new conditions affecting religious life, and the predominance of science and technology. Who can fail to see in these passages an expression of the purest liberalism? We could have had a splendid council by taking for our, matter, uh, for, uh, for our master on the subject of Pope Pius XII. I don't think there's any problem of the modern world and of current affairs that he did not resolve with all his knowledge, his theology, and his holiness. He gave almost definitive solutions, having truly seen things in the light of faith. But things could not have, uh, could not have been seen so when they refused to make it a dogmatic council. Vatican II was a pastoral council. John XXIII said so. Paul VI repeated it. During the course of the sittings, we several times wanted to define a concept, but we were told, we're not here to define dogma and philosophy. We're here for pastoral purposes. What is liberty? What is human dignity? What is collegiality? We are reduced to analyzing the statements indefinitely in order to know what they mean. And we only come up with approximations because the terms are ambiguous. And this was not through negligence or by chance. Father Schielebex admitted it. He says, we have used ambiguous terms during the council, and we know how we shall interpret them afterwards. Those people knew what they were doing. Okay, that's the quote. Dilusia? Uh, no, sorry about that. I was on mute and I was writing some notes because there are some things that I, I wanted to comment on that, but I don't want to derail us too much. So if you had some immediate comments on it, go ahead and do those and then I'll, I'll bring okay. them up. So, okay, so obviously 
um, Lefebvre says that on purpose, there were introduced into the council ambiguities, which maybe, maybe not. Um, and what? For the purpose of what? Uh, he, he says, and he'll say over and over again, in order to confuse the faithful and in order to, uh, I mean, this is, by the way, this is from an open letter to confused Catholics, in order to muddy matters so that on purpose, uh, liberal fathers could get their way. Okay. Mm -hmm. And his evidence is uh, a quote from Schielebecks. Now, this quote came up, it came up. Uh, I think it was a dispute between Tim Gordon and, and Bishop Barron, but it came up a number of months ago, and it was alleged that um, Schielebeck said this thing, and this was decisive proof uh, that the council was made ambiguous on purpose to get basically heretical things done. And um, Bishop Barron responded, well, Schielebeck's never said that. And uh, then this quotation was produced. And I looked in all of Sheila Bex's published works and I said, I can't find it. And then, so I went to Lefebvre because I knew it was from Lefebvre. And I went to Iota Unum, who I think have more fault than Lefebvre. And I tried to track down the citation. And when I tried to track down the citation, what everybody always cites uh, is a French traditionalist magazine called Itiner Itineraries. And uh, we tracked that down, me and my friends. And the French translation is is in is in chunks, and it, it it just exerts this and a couple of other things. And then it refers back to a Dutch translation, a, a Dutch publication called De Bizoon, which was a a um, a Dominican uh, a, a weekly or biweekly magazine, and nobody had that. And we looked all over the internet and nobody had read the original at all. And it seemed really odd because I've read some Schielebecks. I don't like Schielebecks. Um, I think he's an error in a lot of things. But I'd read Schielebecks and I'd read people from the council, uh, Father, you know, Bishop Sheen, lots of people who, who knew directly about the council. And what he's saying doesn't make any sense, uh, even if you have the so-called liberal view. And so I wanted to see, well, what was Schielebeck's talking about? And so we looked it up. And uh, we found it. We contacted the Schielebeck's archives. Uh, we had them send the article over. And uh, guess what? It turned out that the quote was more like this. Let me get it. Mm -hmm. I've got it right here. Okay. Okay. Now he's talking about, now let's be clear, what's mm -hmm. going on? What's the context? So the context is the so-called Black Week. The Black Week was a period during the third session of the Second Vatican Council where a number of things that were important for the traditionalist movement later were formulated. Uh, the big one uh, that Lefebvre talks about a lot, and this obviously was a scarring week for him, um, was uh, is religious liberty. It was formulated this week. But that's not what we're talking about. Right now, we're talking about Lumen Gentium and the Nota Previa Explicativa that was added to the end of Lumen Gentium by the Pope. What's the Nota? So what happened was um, they, they did all of Lumen Gentium more or less as you have it. They'd gotten it down to the end. And there was a question over what collegiality amounts to. Now, collegiality, uh, collegiality, as it's usually articulated right now, is the idea that the Pope is the head of the College of Bishops, and he rules the Church in unity with them, but he's also um, the head of the Universal Church in the, in the way um, that was articulated in Vatican I. And the big question and the big dispute is um, uh, what exactly does his authority amount to uh, and what exactly is his authority in relationship to the authority of the bishops? Um, the so-called progressive view was always to want to say that the Pope in some way needs to be acting with all of the bishops, even though he's their head. 
And the so-called minority or conservative view attempts to preserve a particular view of papal primacy. Um, uh, and the text itself was not exactly clear on the precise relationship um, of the Pope to the bishops and how this would be played out. It's still not that clear. But the Pope had appended to the end of Lumen Gentium, uh, before voting was conducted, an explanatory note, which essentially articulated the more traditional juridical viewpoint. So basically, what's that mean? It means, okay, the Pope acts with the bishops uh, as head of the church, but also on his own, he acts as an as a, a individual authority over the church. That's the big dispute. The big, the ultimate, the super progressive dispute would be like, can the Pope act on it, like act without, if all the bishops objected, could the Pope do something? And the super progressive view would be something like either no, or if he did so, it would be a grievous problem and uh, he would need to, he'd have a moral obligation to fix it or something along those lines. It's not per se conciliarism, but it's, moral conciliarism in the sense that, look, you really got to talk to everybody. And if you don't talk to everybody, you shouldn't say anything. That's the ultra progressive view. That didn't win. Uh, the lighter view is more that the Pope has a kind of moral obligation, uh, but can act on his own if he needs to. And the traditional view, at least what was said to be the traditional view is uh, the church is a kind of monarchy and the Pope reigns over the bishops. Uh, this also didn't win. Um, so what's Schielebeck's talking about? So Schielebeck's is, is talking about, he during the Black Week, it had become clear that the, the, the moderate view would win. And many of Schielebeck's readers didn't like this. And he'd written about it a week before, and it had upset people. And so he's right, he writes another article in De Bazoon to clarify what happens. And he's talking about different approaches to get the so-called more progressive view. And uh, he's saying, what, what did they do? Um, one approach was to try to be ambiguous and then to do it differently later. And speaking on this, he says, even Congar had long before objected to a consciously so-called ambiguous council text. A theologian from the doctrinal commission to whom I'd already complained on the second session about the so-called minimalism of papal collegiality in the new schema, that is to say, well, we don't get to do much with this collegiality. It doesn't empower the bishops too much in uh, relation to the Pope. Attempted to comfort me by saying, we say it diplomatically, but after the council, we will draw out an implied conclusion. At the time, I found this unfair, and besides, I don't believe in such an interpretation of the council, whereby one category of voters ignore papal collegiality and the other category implies it. There should have been either a clear text wherein maximalism, that is to say, strong power uh, of the bishops with respect to the pope, was unambiguously formulated, or a clear text wherein a more minimalistic interpretation which the schema explicitly formulates, is gutted of its ambigu ambiguous vagueness through silence of the actual problem. That's all the quote says. And uh, that doesn't have, what doesn't that imply? Well, that doesn't even imply that Lumen Gentium is ambiguous on collegiality, let alone that the whole council is ambiguous on everything, which is what the quote is usually taken to prove. Um, and the fact that this narrative has been set up on the basis of a, a misquoted quote of some theologian at the council by Schielebeck um, is a problem. And it's a problem because it's symptomatic of the way traditionalist political narratives work. That is to say, I heard some guy said something, gossip, that establishes my worst fears, and therefore my worst fears are true. And that's how we should think about the church. Well, that's crazy. A and it's crazy for two reasons. One, it's crazy because it's false. You don't believe false things. Uh, it's crazy because um, we can see the problems. We don't need other fantasy problems. 
the problems are the problems you can see. It's not, it's not magic problems. There's the obvious problems in front of you. The lack of discipline, um, you know, uh, listening too much with no correction, listening too much with no guidance, weak pastors, weak universal pastor, a weak laity, uh, intrusion of, uh, of uh, 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 secular beliefs, all sorts of things. We can look at those right away. Why do we need made up stories? Mm. And uh, that's the whole point of this research. That's what I've been looking at. And I, I wanted to talk about it because it's a big deal. So it actually wasn't <clears throat> Skilovics. And I, I think I'm pronouncing them incorrectly. That's the way I've always heard it. But you, you said uh, Shilovix, I guess, was it? Shilovix. My, 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 Dutch is, my Dutch is not any good. So. <laughs> I'll do my best to say that, but I can't guarantee I'll maintain that. Uh, standard for pronunciation the rest of this show but my question then is so it wasn't actually him who said it he was now he was actually noting that someone else said that was that was the intention correct so, or did so, i misunderstand yeah, so he notes who does he say it is it's so not even a bishop a uh -huh. theologian from the doctrinal commission who was trying to comfort him about mm -hmm. being downtrodden mm -hmm. some guy hanging out who had yeah. some part to play, who wasn't even a voting member, okay. basically. Okay. And this is one example. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. But we often hear it presented as if they're, all of the Pariti are just, you know, intentionally putting ambiguity into the text, or even worse, that many of the bishops, that was their intention. Is there any evidence for that from what you've seen in your studies of the Second Vatican Council so far? So again, I'm not an expert mm -hmm. on the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. uh, I I picked up all the books around this issue that I could pick up. I picked right. up the the big um uh the what is the what's the school we're not supposed to like the um oh yeah I mean the Rhine flows into the Tiber is that the Wilkins well, no, no, book is that no, what you're no I picked up Wilkins book but I mean the liberal one the the mainstream one the big five volume collection. Um, oh, Vorm, Vorm Grimler's um, commentary, right? Uh, no, the history. Vor the history. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The uh, of the um, oh, what's the school? Yeah, I, I think I might know what you're talking about, but I, I was thinking of uh, I don't, Vorm Grimler's I don't, commentary. I, I, I could pull it up later, but the, the I, I know what you're. I'm vaguely recalling it because I was. Um, Tegel wrote. Tegel wrote the uh, chapter on the Black Week. Cardinal now, Bishop then. Yeah, drawing a blank on it too. Oh. But did you read Davies, for example, Liturgical Time Bombs in Vatican uh, II? Um, <laughs> well, uh, no, not for this. But, uh, yeah. but, but it's the same narrative. Exactly. That's exactly the point. You'll see it there in figures like Michael Davies. So... From what you're saying, however, explicit, you know, attestation to actual intentions for ambiguity. Um, to your knowledge, you've only seen one, correct? So, okay, let's be clear. There was ambi ambiguity in the text mm -hmm. in the same way that there's ambiguity in Trent, in mm -hmm. the same way that there's ambiguity in Vatican I. What does that right. say? There's right. a minority party and sure. there's a majority party right. and they want to come to consensus and how do you do that? Well, you write yeah. it in such a way that it's it's um, you you preserve what you can preserve. Yeah, that that's every council, right? Um, and that yeah. that that everybody explicitly says was like right. like the, there was an uh, Paul the sixth and, and John the twenty third wanted to have the minority integrated. And by the right. way, the minority is the the con hot, heavy conservative traditionalist faction. That mm -hmm. is to say, the faction that lost. Um, and. Uh, but th there was no the idea of weaponized ambiguity that is to say first of all the per the pariti don't even have control over this okay the pariti are advisors schilebeck mm -hmm. is not even a pariti he's like an auditor who's renting an apartment in uh, in rome at the time giving talks that people mm -hmm. would come to of their own free will i thought he was a pariti maybe i'm wrong no i read mm -hmm. and grant if i'm wrong i'm wrong i read that he wasn't even allowed to be an official paritas Huh. Uh, but he's sk still giving talks, so he's okay. functionally a okay. Paritas. But uh, he's not – Ratzinger's a, an actual official Paritas. Right. Schielebeck's right. isn't. Right. Um, okay. And he's hanging out, and he's okay. giving advice, and people are listening. So he might as well be. What difference does it make? Mm -hmm. But he doesn't have an official drafting position. Mm -hmm. um, and 
do you is like first of all it's just not it would not have been allowed for one guy to come in and say hey everybody we're going to trick this is a, these are huge meetings okay with big draft boards hey we're going to trick everybody into voting for something that so that later we can have a bunch of heresy the pope wouldn't have allowed that the thousands of bishops there would not have allowed that and most of the the Pariti wouldn't have allowed it like that. What you have is something like what you literally have on conciliarism, which is, look, um, we would like to explore different ways to relate bishops and the Pope that uh, aren't clear from what we dogmatized in the First Vatican Council. And um, uh, we think we can do it within the bounds of uh, doctrine already articulated. Like what most people don't understand is that doctrine is a lot more open than it appears to be. Um, you can go in a lot of directions just with what you got from Vatican I. And people who have maybe heretical beliefs, maybe proximate to heretical beliefs, are perfectly capable of pinning things within orthodoxy that uh, they can work with. You don't have to have uh, outright heresy coded in the text. You don't have to have um, ambiguity so that you can uh, trick anybody. You can just put orthodox things down and work with it. That's always been the case. We, we, we People were able to do that with Trent uh, and Vatican I. Ultramontanism is a heresy uh, that you can work with off of perfectly valid Vatican I principles. Uh, right. There's no problem. So why do we have to say there was a big plan? There wasn't a plan. This to say w people would come if they had weird positions, if they had ultra progressive positions. They say, yeah, we favor this because you know we personally later will say whatever we want to say, and this is kind of close to it. So what? That's not anything on the council, and that's not a real plan. That's individual plans, mm -hmm. and which is what they did. And you know what happened? Uh, John Paul II told them to stop, and uh, most of it, you know except in total disobedience did stop. Hmm. You um <clears throat> you mentioned Lefebvre there earlier not to, you know, go down a rabbit trail too far, but I do think it was worth noting. He mentioned it was pastoral only. We hear that thrown around a lot. Um I I want to make some comments on that, but first I'll, I'll give you a, a chance to maybe comment on it. Do you do you think that Vatican II was just trying to be pastoral only, or is there maybe doctrine here as well? I don't understand how pastoral and doctrinal is to be exclusive in any case. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, uh, what does it if if the pastor if the if the pastor comes and tells me doctrine is that he being pastoral? Right. Pastoral, from everything I understand, appears to be a mode of presentation. Right. A doctrinal council is a council that goes out and says, uh, we're working on doctrine. Uh, here they are, 10, yeah. 20 of them, whatever. A pastoral council is like, look, we're working on your life and how things operate and the life of the church as a whole. But there's no reason that in the middle of that they couldn't go, oh, guess what? The, Episcop uh, the, the episcopacy is the fullness of holy orders, which they did. So that's a doctrine. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care right. what you want. It's a doctrine. Right. Um, so, uh, but does that, so the, but it's a, it's presented in, in hundreds of pages of texts that are concerned with other things. Yeah. So you would say that the text is pastoral and as far as it's primarily concerned with the life of the church in the modern world, but that doesn't mean it has heavy doctrines in it. Right. Uh, it, and you don't have to have a council that has mostly doctrines in it. So what? It's presenting doctrine in a pastoral way. Um, which you know there there there's some room for criticism uh the way it was done but uh yeah you're right i mean you you can't separate the two right they they do go hand in hand and you brought up the issue there of the sacramentality of the episcopate which is of great interest to me um since that's part of what i'm dealing with in the dissertation is whether or not that was definitively taught so it catches my ear when i hear people like uh lefebvre saying pastoral only and yet, Lumen Gentium is full of doctrine. You mentioned right there a doctrinal dispute that was settled. He also noted that it did not define anything, and yet, maybe it did in the case you just meant. That could be argued. What's interesting, though, is the opening speech of the third session. Paul VI says that that matter that you just addressed, the sacramentality of the Episcopate, is going to be addressed in a way that can't be questioned any longer does that yeah. mean definitive maybe 
maybe. Does that mean just authoritative, non-definitively taught, but it can't be questioned by the average person, but maybe the magisterium could come and reform it? I could see that. I could see that as well. So we could have that debate on whether or not it was definitively taught, but that it was taught is is well established. It was doctrine. It was a teaching. And that's something that I think a lot of people who really just kind of buy this stuff hook, line, and sinker don't really notice. I had somebody yesterday, a very well-known professor, uh, although theology is not his area, he's a philosophy professor, uh, posted in response to my uh, post on Twitter saying Vatican II didn't teach heresy. He asked the question, did Vatican II teach anything? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if that was tongue in cheek, right? That maybe it was. But at the very least, that does represent a lot of people's perspective that Vatican II taught nothing. It was just entirely pastoral, as if the two could be exclusive to one another. And then it's just factually not true. Vatican II taught quite a few things. <laughs> so, I mean, this, it's got to be, uh, I, as, uh, and I came into the church uh, through a traditionalist line. Um, when I converted, I mean, I, I, you know, I read Thomas, uh, I read guys like Lefebvre. Um, I read all, you know, I didn't have a big view. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't have a great view of Vatican II. I came in under pre 55 liturgy. My baptism took eight hours. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't have a problem with any of the things that, that treads like, mm -hmm. but, uh, what I do have a problem with is I have a problem with gossip. Uh, mm -hmm. I got have a problem with lies and I have a problem as a, as a thinker and as, um, as a, a person who's spent a lot of time on academic work, I have a lot, a big problem with, with, um, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to call it lies, but just unclarity and teaching people th things badly, even if it's for a good purpose. Like I, uh, Iota Unum, I actually hold to a higher level of responsibility than Lefebvre. Mm -hmm. I can, I can read a letter, an open letter to confused Catholics is this is a big sermon he's giving in, in mm -hmm. a book. And he, he's going a little out there and he's just trying to warn the flock. Okay. Iota Unum is supposed to be a research text mm -hmm. about the history of the problems that in and stem from the council. And even then, all they do is they cite the French translation in a traditionalist magazine. Mm -hmm. They don't go to the Dutch magazine. They don't give you the real context in order to what? In order to establish a narrative we don't need. Because I need to fight the things that are actually a problem, not the things that aren't a problem. What am I going to do? My bishop uh, is, a, is a good man, uh, fairly conservative. People accuse him of weaponized ambiguity and all this narrative stuff. And he looks at him and he goes, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. Because he's not participating in any of this because it's not real. Mm -hmm. The problems he has are the problems that he actually has. Yeah. Not fantasy problems. Yeah. And I, I don't know what to do about that. Because it's it's bad for the soul to live in a fantasy about how bad things are. It's also bad for the soul to think that 2,000-something bishops can get together and malevolently attempt to destroy the church, and we have to save it from the Internet or from right. our, our, our weird periodical in the 80s where we complain about it. Like, how is that supposed to work? It makes no sense. I joined the faith for the church, not to complain with everybody. Yeah. I, and and you, you mentioned something there that was interesting. You're trying to deal with actual real issues that are matters of concern, not hearsay and lies. Uh, that, that's well said. Because there are things that we would criticize. There are some problems that we need to address. We don't need to add confusion to the matter in things that aren't issues we have enough real issues to deal with there is enough criticism that could be leveled against the second vatican council that does need to be addressed without having to bring in this other stuff but i just want to be consistent and say but we could also apply that to other things we could apply some of those criticisms to some of the fathers we could apply some of those criticisms to some theologians and to some popes and some councils let's just keep things in perspective and not think that this is unique to the conciliar and post-conciliar era that's one of my concerns is people think that, that Prior to the Second Vatican Council, these things just didn't happen. Then from the Second Vatican Council on, uh, everything is just, you know, in Oh, chaos. Lord. 
No, I listen to scholars on to, to prep for this. To like, I listen to scholars on Trent. Like, they let laymen come in and talk about having married priests. Mm. They let all sorts of weird stuff go on in Trent that you wouldn't believe. Now they didn't do any of it, mm-hmm. but they had. You know, if if you're like, oh, Protestant observers, they invited Protestants to Trent. Mm-hmm. They wanted Protestant mm-hmm. observers at Trent. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, so what? So what if there's some guy you don't like there? Did we catch the cooties from the Protestants? That's Dude. another one. Uh, the the concilium, the a, after the council, you hear that uh, Protestants had all kinds of uh, vote and and how the liturgy was going to be reformed. And in fact, people who were part of the uh, concilium note that that wasn't the case at all. They actually had no authority and very, very little input when it comes to the reform of the liturgy. Not that the reform of the liturgy has been done very well, but just get the facts straight, you know. And so that's another one that we we hear a lot and I, I wish was corrected a little bit more. I don't know if you've looked into that before. I mean, when... I mean, no, yeah, I've looked into it, and it doesn't look that. It looks like uh, everybody wanted to have dinner with these guys, and then what? Nothing. Yeah. My, my, I've got a conservative Anglican friend, a traditionalist, so-called Anglican friend, who looks at all this stuff, and he goes, "What are you? What is this talking about? Like, the uh, the we didn't this this the 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 liturgy you have doesn't resemble anything that uh, that uh, we would want, uh, and it's not admi- And if you're a Reformed Protestant, it's not admissible." And you know that because James White doesn't like the liturgy. Like, I mean, what, like uh, Protestants don't like the liturgy. So how did we make a Protestant liturgy that doesn't make sense? You mean we simplified it? My conservative Anglican friend says, yeah, those are obvious simplifications you would have made to the Roman Rite <laughs> if you wanted to make it simplified. We've had the problem with simplifying the liturgy going back to the early first, uh, early part of the first millennium. That's been one of the con- criticisms of the Roman Rite is that it was always the more simplified version. P- compare it to Chrysostom's liturgy, which itself was also simplified compared to a much more elaborate and longer liturgy. So, I mean, that that criticism kind of goes both ways, but it's especially true of the Roman Rite. You can even see uh, Adrian Fortescue in his work on the Mass talking about this is one of the features of the Roman Rite. And he's talking about before the Second Vatican Council that it was always known for simplifying things and being brief. Now, we could have criticisms here and say okay it went too far made it too simple and maybe took out some things that it shouldn't have that it labeled as redundant we can have that discussion but this discussion still needs to be had in a greater context going back in the preconciliar era we need to recognize that this criticism applies even to th- some things in in that time as well that's my thing just being consistent and realizing things uh some of this is applicable even prior to the second Vatican Council. But um, you know, I don't know. It's uh it, like what I would really like, what I would really like is I would really like a uh I don't care, a traditionalist, super conservative, post-traditional, I don't care what it is. I'd like a, a, a history of the council and the history of the 20th century that really tried to look at the sources and tried to look at what everybody said and then tried to cut a path through the middle of it. Because our narrative about how confusing everything is, is confusing and confuses traditionalist faithful who, as you know, sometimes leave for orthodoxy, who leave mm-hmm. for state of vacantism. And I've mm-hmm. seen it in my parish, yeah. in my own life. And that's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, the Christ is supposed to empower my life through his grace in the church. And if we tell a story that ruins that uh, and sends everybody into schism and heresy, uh, something's wrong. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, and we need a, we need a new voice and I don't mean a a progressive voice for the modern world and all that crap. I mean, uh, you know, we need a new voice that really looks at things in the face and collects them together and says, well, this is where we're going to go now. Mm. Yeah. Um, one, one other thing that I wanted to bring up there really quickly, uh, since we were talking about Lefebvre earlier, And since you brought him up when it comes to this quote, what's interesting when it comes to ambiguity in the text, he initially signed off on these documents. It didn't 
It was a, this, it was a, a, there were only five dissenters on Lumen Gentium. Yeah. Five. So he didn't necessarily see the ambiguity then. It no. was only seen later. So in other words, he read it in a way that was reconcilable with tradition. Yeah. And he did, he did continuously. If you read his letters, he says, yeah, I read it. I read it in continuity with tradition. Even the Declaration on Religious Liberty, he reads and, and he signed it. There was, he was never a dissenter. And, and uh, when he's, if he's ever asked to explain, uh, oh, no, he never explains it. If anybody's ever asked to explain why he signs off on it, they say, oh, well, he was so loyal to the papacy. Nonsense. No, he wasn't. <laughs> so uh, he, he fought with them later. So what's going on? What's going on is that you can read it in continuity with tradition and mm -hmm. you're supposed to, and you better because it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, how would explain to me if, if, if Vatican II is a rupture, if mm -hmm. the council is a, a new thing and we don't have to ignore the, how's a council make any sense? Oh, that a council has no authority. If councils don't have authority, mm -hmm. Vatican II has no authority. If, if councils don't work, if they don't have power, so you can't appeal to Vatican II to do anything. If you believe that Vatican II has no power by virtue of, if you believe councils, prior councils have no power by virtue of uh, this rupture you've created, then the Vatican II itself has no power because a council is a traditional structure. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue if you want to be some kind of radical. It doesn't work. And you have to. Contextually, you have to. This is why I think people end up going down that path, end up saying that, Vatican II taught heresy or was not an ecumenical council, you know, th things like that. They, they have to end up kind of going that route because it, this <coughs> just simply can't be maintained consistently. I can, I can generate heresy from every uh, Vatican one. Uh, well, it looks like the Pope is King over all bishops in every respect. Right. Yeah. And uh, the bishops aren't real and they're his servants. No, that's a heresy. We could do that with the Council of Ephesus, right? Ephesus 1, 431. Uh, we could do the same thing, which some people did. And then we had to have Chalcedon to offset that, right? Because some things, not faulting Cyril, but some things in the language that he used didn't necessarily, you know, was a little confusing let's just put it that way and so chalcedon had to come and emphasize the other side to it which then chalcedon had some concerns too so then you have uh, of course the fifth council trying to balance some of that out which ended up doing some uh more <laughs> more damage and so yeah th that that's that's the thing we can make these same criticisms and apply them uh, unfairly to Ephesus and Chalcedon and things like that. Um, and, and I don't think that people do that whenever they apply this to the Second Vatican Council. I don't think that they're really thinking, well, I, I wonder if I could apply that to Constantinople I or Ephesus or Chalcedon. They generally don't because they generally don't even know the history. So, uh, And one other thing I've noticed they tend to be the very people who have never read any of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. They tend to be. I, I had somebody the other day who was uh, criticizing Vatican II, talking about how it just was a disruption and how it just tore up the faith. And I asked him point blank, have you ever read the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council? And he said, nope. <laughs> let's start there. <laughs> let's start there. Let's let's read the documents. And then we'll continue this discussion later. <laughs> How are you supposed to be loyal to the church? You don't read what she says. Yeah. Um, look, I get that not all of us have time to sit down and read. Just every, I get maybe you haven't had the chance, but then refrain from making those comments about it and those judgments about it. If you haven't even read it, that's my thing. Read it first and then let's talk. Well, some people are intimidated and they feel that they wouldn't be able to understand it. No, actually, the, the opposite is the case. It's written in a very pastoral way. It's written in very non-technical language. We can fault it for that, but that is the truth. It is written in a way that's pretty straightforward. Um, I guess, is there, were there any, like, I didn't really have a goal to this other than to get out to clarify this. Was there any question from the audience? Because, yeah, uh, y'all go ahead and send some questions. Make sure to send it to at reason in theology. The chat has been very lively, so I'm I, sure yeah, there's going to be plenty, <laughs> plenty of questions. So again, send them to at reason in theology. Um, here's one. Okay. 
If there is misrepresentation, what do you suggest to counter the immense misrepresentation of Lefebvre by even SSPX priests and laity who go to their chapels and defend the society? Well, first, prayer. Prayer for them. You have to pray for these people. Um, and they, they, I don't, this is, I'm not here to criticize SSPX and SSPX bashing. I think that um, in comparison to a lot of options you have in the church uh, that are also schismatic and uh, or not i'm not saying they're schismatic excuse mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. that are also um marginal mm -hmm. that also have some problems they're not the worst problem no the sspx really isn't the worst problem in the church uh, absolutely today. absolutely not uh, <laughs> I, in in terms of actual participation in sspx besides a couple of weird things but we don't need to talk about slander um uh, I, I don't have a problem with the, the pastoral life they try to co uh, commit themselves to. Some of the things they teach, and Ripperger talks about this, especially about jurisdiction, aren't, aren't, aren't any good. And the things that they teach about the council, that's not okay. And you don't need to spread that to people. Um, and the things that they teach about the, the, the contemporary liturgy, not its deficiencies, which are obvious, but it's, I mean, they teach that it's, they all but teach that it's positively sinful to the extent that they want you to confess it. And many of them do. They're teaching that it's mortally sinful, the liturgy. And that's not acceptable. That's um, I, I, I can't see how you can be in union with the church, which is what they say they are. And also teach that the church habitually um, yeah. uh, airs right. on liturgy. Right. You have to say the church is apostate if you believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's no longer holy. And uh, that's not okay. And that's contrary to the tradition, which they're trying to preserve, which I have sympathetic. Um, uh, really what I want the SSPX to do is I want the SSPX to be the champions of the traditionalist reading of the Vatican Council. Right. Why can't you do that? Right. Not this game where, oh, it didn't exist. It existed and you need to account for it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but what, so, but what to do? What was the fullness of his questions? Because I don't want to miss uh, it. Bring it back up here. Here we go. Yeah, so um, Lefebvre himself, I believe, is a good man. Um, he, he, I, he didn't do everything right, uh, but I think that black the council was hard on everybody. You could mm -hmm. see it's hard on progressives. Progressives are very sad, got very upset. Um, they thought they're going to get democracy church, mm -hmm. I mean, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, and you, I read, I read a lot of progressives and they were, uh, you know, and by the way, they don't, the problem is that when the progressives don't say what, that they were trying to do this, you have an issue. Like they, when the progressives don't know what you're talking about, you have an issue. Mm -hmm. But in, in any case, um, everybody was upset. It was a stressful period. Lefebvre comes out. Um, uh, he, he feels stressed, but I think he thinks it can be recovered, especially after Umani Vitae. It looks like the papacy is pulling things together, especially after the credo of the people of God. It looks like the papacy is trying to rein things in. And then he's got his society. He's going to rein things in as a bishop personally with his priests. And then they, he has this papal, this is what they say in their biography. He has this papal visit and the papacy to the society before it was on the outs. And they send these, at least this is what they say. I don't know if it happened or not, but this is what they thought happened. They send these liberal priests who to, to, to view the society and they don't believe in, um, they don't believe in uh, uh, transubstantiation. They say all sorts of insulting things and he's scandalized. And he thinks that represents the entirety of the of the Coria. He thinks that represents the entirety of the state of the church. And he just spirals into more and more um, narrative up into the 80s when he does the consecration, at which point I don't even understand. I don't understand because the Vatican was willing to make a deal with him. The Vatican was willing to let him have two bishops he wanted four. Um uh, and he and not only did he want four, but he was afraid that the Vatican, that Ratzinger was going to wait until he died and not give the society any bishops. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know if he got paranoid. I don't know if he acted in bad faith by the end. I don't know. But I want to believe that he was a good man. Mm -hmm. What I don't accept is I don't accept in the society left behind and in the friends to it, gossip, calumny, distortion, um, detraction. Mm -hmm. All the things you're not supposed to do as a as a traditionalist. 
Um, what I what I would love the society to do is I'd love the society to be a stalwart of the manualist tradition. I'd love the society to be uh, to to use all of the resources they've been cultivating for forty years to revitalize traditionalism. They could be gr great theological center. They could be a great. Um, uh, they they could be they could be real ecumenism. They could uh, they could be a great missionary center, but instead they want to go in a totally different direction, and they don't have to. Mm. And I wish they wouldn't. Seems um, from the best I've been able to verify, and um, you know I've I've kind of seen this from SSPX and also non SSPX sources, so it's, it does seem to be authentic. It appears that Lefebvre actually called the real church schismatic. He says, I'm not in schism. The, the church, basically, the modernist church of Rome is in schism from me. That's yeah. very troubling to me. He says um, uh, he says everything. And if he said it towards his older age, I, I'll, I, I excuse him for his anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I, I really, in his, I really for, the, for, the, for in his heart, for what he was trying to do, I feel for him. For, yeah. and, and then whatever he said, I don't know. I mean, maybe he's a homilist and sometimes you get, because I can see in his writing, he kind of, he writes extemporaneously. He writes what's in his heart and right. he's honest. And sometimes when you, when you write that way and when you talk that way, um, it doesn't come out right. Right. And, and if you sat him down and you said, look, is that you, do you really, are you committed to that? Uh, like this has this in, entailment. He, would he walk it back? I hope so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to. What, what upsets me more is Michael Davies, who's mm. who's presenting himself with scholarship, and it's mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, I, I sat down with a lot of Anglicans about uh, his book on uh, the liter his books on the liturgy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and on Cranmer, and they don't know what he's talking about, and it doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, I, I've said I myself read his work on modernism; it doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, he, I, I, Iota Unum, which is not in SSPX, but is is you know down this line is supposed to be a scholarly guidebook and it contains this distortion straight mm -hmm. from Lefebvre it just wrote it back down why mm -hmm. why is that necessary we why why is the the schismatic church that you don't like why are they the good scholars and we're bad scholars mm -hmm. why why is that necessary it isn't uh somebody's saying how did you get the documents they're they're online for free access the, those right you now mean, do, wait does he mean the Skilobex documents or does he mean the um does he well, maybe he does because he doesn't say specifically. So maybe if, answer that. If he means the Skelebex documents, we went to this. We my Dutch friend, well, my English friend who's in on the continent, uh, went to this called the Skelebex archives up, and they sent it over. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me get his name because he wanted to be credited. Mm -hmm. And we have a full translation, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to provide it. But mm -hmm. um, what is it? Uh, uh. Yeah, uh, the translation from Dutch to English was done by uh, Gregory Alabaster, who also proofreads English texts. And I'll provide, I'll, I'll get a bibliography together later. I'll send it to you. You can append it to this uh, in a couple of days. Uh, thank you for the super chat. When trads appeal to a weaponized ambiguity, they are appealing to an unfalsifi unfalsifiable conspiracy theory, especially when the trads can't point out which documents have the weaponized ambiguity. Any uh, thoughts on that one? I don't like uh, I and I didn't use the phrase conspiracy theory. Ed Fazer mm. talks about conspiracy theory. Look, if there's a conspiracy, uh, then you know if the theory is not a theory; it's a fact. So there's there's nothing wrong with the idea that there was a conspiracy to do something. Um, it's more that look, the we, we're all Tom. We're all supposed to be Thomists. We're all supposed to be traditionalists. We're all supposed to believe in the truth. The narrative has to point to something. If you've got a narrative and it's very compelling and it gets people in the pews and they're very upset and it gets people fired up and then it turns out to not be true or only partially true, drop the part that's not true. That's it. There's nothing more to say about it. If the narrative doesn't work, if it's not representative, if it's distortive, you need to drop it and get a more accurate one. Um, or get an accurate one and then get a paraphrase that's compelling. Uh, you know, what do you want me to do? The truth is the truth. I'm dedicated to the church and the truth, not to what gets butts in the pews at uh, some SSPX chapel somewhere. What I care about is what happened. And I don't think the 2,000 bishops, including bishops that the SSPX loves, that uh, traditionalists love, like that uh, Fulton, like Fulton Sheen says none of this happened. Why? Because it didn't. 
Like the what? Like uh, are we supposed to believe that this man who everybody wants to be a saint just lies to lie? No, it's it's that the narrative isn't right. Something's wrong. It's we didn't get it right. We we got carried away, um, and that the problems that we have are the problems we have, and they're problems because. I mean, almost all of our problems are just problems that the world has. All of our sexual problems are problems that the world had already. All of our problems with, like, we don't want to obey, uh, obey absolute authority. That was a problem the world had. And the world had it decades before we had it. And it's not surprising that it crept into the church because those problems always creep into the church. You don't need a, a big story about a bunch of lies. It's just, look, we've gotten habituated this way because we live in the world and we don't want to reject it. But that's the story of the gospel. That's mm -hmm. the story that you could find that in Paul, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. If you could find it in Paul complaining about somebody having incest uh, with their stepmother, then why would you not expect it in 1968? God help us. Mm -hmm. This one um, might clarify what you're talking about earlier. It's just a footnote, but I think that at the beginning of the show, River talked about Al Barrigo's history of Vatican II. He was from That's the Bologna the, school. Yeah, the uh, Bologna school. That was what I wanted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that the, I read that and uh, got, guess what? They don't know what we're talking about. And they yeah. take sides with, um, I don't like to call it the liberal side. It's the majority. They won. Like the, the one of the things I don't like about the conservative side is that the, um, the uh, oh, coetibus patrum internalia, whatever the international fathers, the conservative group that um, that um, that uh, Lefebvre was with. The reason they lost is because they didn't get anybody on their side. There was like ninety of them in mm -hmm. two thousand bishops. You lost. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit wasn't with you. Uh, I don't know what to say. Like I mean, they were useful and helpful um, in reigning. Like look, what's what were they useful for? What was the minority useful for? They were useful in making sure that we grounded what we were saying in doctrine that was already set down because you don't want a council that's just out there in space and we have to piece it back together. And they were helpful in grounding the council, but they lost. And uh, the, all the bishops thought that we needed to ground things in the modern contemporary situation. And guess what we do? Because this situation is unprecedented. Absolutely. Reminds me of Chalcedon because, you know, Chalcedon, didn't condemn the three chapters and so the western bishops were really upset whenever you have the emperor wanting to push for a condemnation of the three chapters they were really mad because they were saying Chal chalcedon didn't do this and so they were toting the traditional line and yet of course they were uh overturned arguably by an ecumenical council um, but you have that reaction there, that conservative traditional reaction of no, Chalcedon didn't do this. Why are we going against, uh, somewhat against, you know, some, something that account that another council didn't do kind of the same thing going on here, but, uh, obviously somewhat of a different situation. But again, we, we can apply these things consistently. Uh, if we're going to be consistent, we can apply them to other councils as well, as far as criticisms, um, here's one, the testimony of father Jacques Maison, who was Icona's e uh, first superior and left for the FSSP in 1988 is most interesting to understand Lefebvre's evolution. I have to check into it cause I, I haven't looked I'll into look at it. Yeah. You know, I never heard of it. Yeah. I, I haven't either. Um, somebody's talking about a CC 86. <laughs> Um, what do you want with the CZ 86? Yeah. Do, I do I think he, do I think he should have done it that way? Absolutely not. Uh, I right. would have done it a totally different way, but I'm not the Pope and God didn't put me there. Right. Uh, uh, do, what do you want? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. They, they're just mentioning it. I don't know if there was context to it. I didn't see it, but oh, uh, I saw, I saw him. He thinks it's apostasy. I've seen him in the chat. Uh, he, was in, he was in the last chat. I, I'd uh, love it. We, should, we could do a whole show on a CZ, but, um, yeah. you know, the Pope can the Pope do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it great? No. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking. I uh, really want to read Ratzinger's work on Vatican II highlights on the council. Have you read it? Yeah. The, the in, in report? A, well, the highlights of Vatican II oh, that he released. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have it. I've I've read through bits of it, but of course, what's interesting is his comments there on Dignitatis Humanae, which he wrote really early on when he was young. Seems like he kind of had um, didn't necessarily maintain that in his later years. Young so Ratzinger, young Ratzinger was totally traumatized after Humanae Vitae. 
Mm-hmm. He, uh, he, so you can see that what he thinks is what Ratzinger wants is, uh, and this is very German, uh, Ratzinger wants a conservative revolution. And uh, what he gets is uh, bishops' conferences thinking they're the Pope. And uh, that's not right. That's not that's not right according to the gospel. Um, like there, there's a collegiality is almost certainly de fide, even mm-hmm. if it's not de fide definita. But mm-hmm. the, the model is not all of the other apostles tell Peter what to do when they feel like it. Mm. And uh, that's what came out. And uh, he uh, by the 80s, he's uh, pretty much convinced that the model needs to be revised. And that's what he did. He did in his papacy. He did it with John Paul II. And uh, he was right to do it. The commenter mentions, no, I mentioned the CC event because of the 88 consecrations. And that was one of the justifications for Lefebvre. But the question still remains, was that the proper response that he should have taken? You you could say, yeah, it was especially because of a CC. Okay, I get that. But we still have to ask the question, should this have been done? Um, Internally, internally, that's not what he says. And that's not what they say. Internally, Mm -hmm. they say it's because he thought that Ratzinger was going to wait him out until he died. Mm -hmm. i've heard that a lot as well yep um uh any any thoughts on father harden he helped me a ton in seeing another side to the 20th century controversies what do you think there i I use john harden in uh in catechesis i've got a marian catechist that works with me uh obviously that's the whole if you don't know about marian catechists it's a it's a i don't know if you call it a it's not an order but a, a religious a religious group founded by harden i like harden a lot sometimes harden takes a sometimes harden likes to read into things but for all for the most part there's nothing wrong with him and his by the way his uh harden's handling of ecumenicism of world religions that's the one we have to have Mm -hmm. he study it know what it says be accurate about it and then respond to it from the heart of the faith and don't be a jackass that's like, a, and that's, but that's, you know, don't be a jackass, by the way, is the guide for the entire traditionalist movement. Uh, 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 but Hardin was a master at it. And how do you do that dialogue, which you don't want to do? And what's dialogue? We'll see what they say and then respond to it accurately. Hmm. I, uh, I don't see any offhand anymore in the chat. So any concluding thoughts that you wanted to offer really quickly? Um, uh, you, I mean, like, look, for me, the, my whole work on traditionalism, which I, I would love to abandon and never look at again, is don't get on narratives. Look at what is and deal with it as it is and pray about it and be accurate with it and, and uh, dialogue with it and correct it. You Like a, a work of mercy is, is, is fraternal correction. Fraternal correction presupposes that you truthfully assess what the brother says, not something else. If you tell a bro- here's the problem, and it's a sin. If you tell a brother a lie about what he says, you not only don't correct him, generally speaking, you mislead his soul. Mm. You condemn somebody by, by telling a false story to them. And I, I think that that's happened... Uh, innumerable times uh, Mm. on these narratives and it needs to be stopped and Mm. that's what bothers me um last one do you or run believe that there are any errors in vatican ii documents what kind of error do you mean that's a good question you mean theologically (laughs) you mean you mean you do you mean that would incur a theological censure no do at least a high level one no do uh i i mean the, I think that the orthodox interpretation of uh, Vatican II is safe. Mm-hmm. We have the theological, everything at least has the theological note of safe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, the, it's the question is uh, tone. Everything is fra- things, certain things are phrased in a way that could be taken wrong, but that's hard to avoid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. I didn't always hold that view. Uh, but I, I do agree with what you're saying at this point. I've had to walk back some of my views. I've, I've kind of seen uh, partly through experience and also through others. And then through my studies of the magisterium, I've just seen, okay, th- this is where it leads. <laughs> um, okay. Anyways, well, I think that's going to be it. I appreciate you coming on, River. You're welcome on anytime. I look forward to many more shows with you. Thanks, Michael. 
All right. And everybody, thank you for your time today. Of course, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications so you can be notified of future shows whenever they come up. And then, of course, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us and also get access to extra content and perks and all that good stuff. Till next time, y'all. God bless.